Hey everybody, welcome to my second of two videos on this, the Canon AE-1. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to do everything you need to do with this camera. But the first thing we're gonna do is change the battery because this camera can do nothing whatsoever without the battery. Uh, some cameras only need the battery for light meter reading. This is not one of them. With this camera, the battery does, the, the camera will not function without the battery. So let's pretend this battery is dead and we're going to, I'm not gonna be able to do that easily. Going, nope, that's not gonna work either. This is not easy from this angle. There we go, now I got it. Okay, so once you open the battery door, what you do with this little latch right here, and this is a whole lot easier if you're not using your finger, by the way, using your finger is a good way to break this. What you want to tr do is try to get one of the hot shoe covers that has the key on it that allows this to just pop right open. And if you can get that, it's worth investing a few bucks in to preserve your battery door because these are getting very hard to replace. Once you've opened it, then you just pull the battery out. What you do is you just push down on it and pull it out. This little contact in the bottom here is spring loaded. So that's the one that you want to push against to pull out the battery. Grab your new battery, look for the positive symbol which is generally the red one, regardless of what color the negative is, green, black, blue, I've seen other colors like that. Red is consistently the positive. So you're gonna look for red, drop it in at the top, push it down, and now we have changed our battery, close the door, and you're set, the battery has changed. And like I said, without that battery, your camera is just a paperweight. After you load the, the camera, the battery, what you wanna do is hold the viewfinder up to your eye. And you don't have to take the lens off, by the way, to do it. I just find it makes it a little bit easier. Um, after you load the battery, you wanna hold it up to your eye and push the battery check button here. And what's gonna happen is that that will tell you how good the battery is. Now, inside the viewfinder, there's a little black notch. And when you push this button, the needle should be below that notch. And if the needle is below that notch, then we know the battery is good. And you can check your battery at any time. You don't just have to do it once you've loaded it. If you've had your battery in the camera for a month and you wanna check it, definitely do. And if, the, if you push this and the needle for your meter is exactly on that black notch, then it's time to buy a new battery because the one you have is starting to get weak. And if the needle is above that notch, that means your battery is no longer strong enough for the camera to function properly or it will be dead very soon. So once that needle reach, reaches the notch, buy a new one. As soon as it goes over, pop that new one in. Next thing we're gonna do is mount and unmount lenses. All right, so let me mount this here so I can show you how to take it off first. That's just cumbersome. Anyway, there's an index right here, a little red dot. What you wanna do with the, ooh, I don't have any of the new ones, darn it. With the old silver ringed lenses, what you do is you turn the breech lock on them until that red dot is on the top, and then you can turn them off, there, take them off. With the FDN lenses that are newer than this, they have a black ring on the back and a little silver button. And what you do with those is you push the silver button and then you turn the whole lens. You don't just turn the ring. Slightly different interface and huge oversight on my part not to bring one of those. Anyway, uh, to load the lens with the old silver ones, you find the red dot, you line it up with the red dot, plunk it on, making sure of course that your depth of field preview lever is out and that you cannot see the red dot or the silver release button here. And then just turn this clockwise until it stops. There's no, there's no click. It just comes to a point where it's like, okay, I'm done moving. And that's how you know it's on. With the FDN lenses, what you do is you push the silver button, mount it, and then just rotate the whole lens until it comes to a rest. And that's how you mount and unmount lenses on this camera. Fairly simple thing to do. Next thing we're gonna do is load film, and I'm gonna show you how the inside of the camera works. So to load film, First thing you wanna do is make sure you don't have any film in the camera. Easiest way to do that is just rewind the film without pushing down the film rewind button here. If you do this and you can't rewind it, then you know you have film. 
but if you can just spin it freely, you know there's no film. So we're gonna lift up on this until the back pops open. We're gonna grab our 35 millimeter cassette and drop it in here like this, and then push the film rewind knob back down. I'm gonna pull out a bit of a leader, put it into the film take up spool, and advance, there we go. And this camera's pretty good, you don't have to, some cameras you have to advance a second time, not this one. We're gonna rewind this a little bit to take out the tension. There we go, just like that. You don't wanna crank it, you just wanna rewind it until you get resistance. Now we can close the film back. And you'll notice on the top here it says S. We want to advance three frames. Watch this guy as I advance, by the way. Until we get to the number one. Now we're ready to go. And you noticed as I was advancing, this turned. If this turns, you know that the film is being taken up because it's a mechanical coupling. As the film moves, this is coupled, the forks on this rewind knob are coupled to the cassette. So when the film is pulled out, the, the spool inside the cassette turns, forcing this to turn, that's your, your check. We put 400 ISO film in. We wanna make sure that the ASA ISO ring is set to 400. If it's not, just adjust it to whatever your film speed is. If you put 800 or 100 or whatever in, just make sure that your ASA matches the ISO number of your film. Then just one more time, make sure that there's no tension in it, and we're set to go and start taking photos. So you're going through your day, and you're taking your photos, you're going through your roll of film, and everything's going well. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna show you is what happens inside of your camera when you are using film. If film is one and done, it can record in light exactly one time in a controlled manner by having a proper shutter speed and aperture or in an uncontrolled manner by doing this. If you were to open your film back with your film like this, you would not ever see any of the images. All of the, the light would flood into your film back and erase all of, your, all of your film that's outside of the cassette. So don't open up the film, the film back until you have rewound your film. I'm gonna show you that in a second but I want you to understand what happens inside your camera. So you take your picture and then you advance your film. And let's see if I can show you here. I'll pop this out so you can see the film rewind knob. As you advance your film, this spins because there are forks connected to the film spool. And it just keeps advancing like that. Gets taken up over here. And then once you reach the end of your film, what you're gonna do is find the film rewind button on the bottom, again, keeping your film back closed the entire time, and now you rewind. And this is what happens when you use the rewind knob. As you get close to the end of your film, you're going to hear it come off of this take up spool here. And that's a sound you can hear outside of the camera. And that means that you finish rewinding. What you want to do is rewind until it's completely in the camera. So usually I'll just rewind it about four or five more times after I hear that sound and I know that it is inside of the cassette, completely inside the cassette. I'm leaving a little bit of a leader here because I need to use this film in other videos, but basically you want to have it be completely inside so that you can't reuse the film again. And then what you do is grab your next roll of film and drop it in and repeat, or if you're done for the day, trigger your shutter, close up your camera, and you're good to go. And you can see here, as I push this in place, the forks on the bottom that connect to the inside of the film spool there, right? And that, at, at that point, once you have completely rewound your film cassette, then it's safe to open up the film back and pull your cassette out. And as you'll notice, when we saw earlier, this would not move backwards. What the film rewind button does is allow this to spin freely like that so that the film can move backwards and be rewound. If you try to rewind your film without pushing this film rewind button, you will break your film and very possibly your camera as well. All right, next thing we're gonna talk about with this camera is how to use the flash. There are two ways to connect the flash to this camera. The PC port right here, it doesn't mean personal computer, I forget what it stands for, it's an old timey flash port. These have been standard, they're still standard today, have been since the 30s or 40s. So basically, any flash that you can buy today 
or any standard X flash. That's the, the terminology stands for xenon, which is any flash that does not have an interchangeable bulb can be used on this camera. You can plug it into the PC port or you can plug it into the hot shoe right here. Same exact function. In fact, if you have two flashes, you can plug one into the hot shoe and one into the PC port and they will both trigger. Okay, so that's really easy to do. Let's talk about a little bit of technique and how it works, how flash works first. With your flash, you can use any shutter speed up to and including 1 60th of a second marked by that lightning bolt. So a 60th, a 30th, two seconds and bulb. Anything from bulb to 1 60th will work. Anything faster than 1 60th will not work. And the reason for that is because you have a focal plane shutter in your camera. And what it, a focal plane shutter is two pieces of cloth. The first one travels and then the second one travels and then when you advance the film they go back to their starting point. The film advance also rearms the shutter. So when that first one opens it starts its travel and then the second one comes after it. The shutter speed is not controlled by how quickly the curtains move. They move at exactly the same speed every time they move. The shutter speed is controlled by the time between the first curtain opening and then the second curtain following. So at 1 60th of a second, the first curtain opens and then for some period of time, the entire film plane is exposed to light and then the second curtain comes in behind and closes. And so that, that entire period of time is about 1 60th of a second. Nero's makes no difference. But that is the fastest shutter speed at which all of the film is exposed to light for a brief moment and that's the point at which the, the flash fires. Two second exposure, same thing. First curtain opens, second curtain two seconds later closes. The flash fires when the first curtain finishes its travel. At that point, the flash is triggered. So let's say you set this to one one thousandth of a second. First curtain comes, second curtain's gonna come in right behind it, a very thin sliver. First curtain finishes its travel. At this point, the flash triggers. Everything here is blocked by the shutter, it's gonna be black. Just that thin sliver between the first and second curtain will be illuminated by the flash. So, that is why that won't work. At 1 1 25th of a second, it's just gonna be a wider gap. It might be something like this, let's say. So when you're using a flash, 1 60th of a second and slower is what you need to use. Stop down metering with older FL lenses. So I'm gonna take off this FD lens and I'm gonna grab our FL lens right here which is apparently the one that the meter will not work with. Let's see what's going on with that. All right, so I verified that this lens will work with stop down metering on the camera. So what you wanna do is select the shutter speed that you would like to use. When you look through the viewfinder, you're gonna get a flashing red M and a flashing red dot. Those are just warnings. The flashing red M means you're in full manual mode, which you will get the flashing red M by the way, if you take your standard lens and set it to a manual aperture. We'll talk about how to shoot manual mode with this camera in a minute. And so what you want to do is set your shutter speed here and then set your aperture and half oh and then push the depth of field preview lever in. There we go. We want to have that set to M for manual push the depth of field preview lever in, and then have to press the shutter button. Now what's gonna happen is your meter needle will go to an aperture number in your viewfinder for the, the, for the correct exposure with the shutter speed that you are using. So if you have f5.6 and you push, and 1 60th, and you push this half down and it says f5.6, you're good to go to take your photo. However, if you have to press it and it says F11, you need to go to F11. If it, you have to press it and it says F28, you need to go to F28. And there you go. And then you can take your picture. And that's how you do stop down metering. Now the majority of you will probably not have an FL mount lens, but if you pick one up 
And, and quite frankly, the FL mount lenses are not as good as the later lenses, and they're certainly not as easier to use, as, as easy to use. But if you do pick one up, that's how you're going to do stop down metering with your Canon AE-1. We'll put the standard lens back on here because it's just a whole lot easier to use. One other note about stop down metering with this camera is that if, if you're using apertures of f8 and smaller, which on your FD mount lens would be f8, 11, and 16, then the meter will be you know, less accurate. And that's not this camera. That's almost every camera with stop down metering. The darker the aperture, the less accurate the meter is because they have an accuracy range. So what you want to do if you're doing stop down metering and you want to shoot f8, 11, or 16 is take a meter reading off of f5, 6. So if proper exposure at f5, 6 is 1 60th of a second and you want to stop down two stops to f11, adjust your lens to f11 at that point and then go to 1 15th. That's going to give you the same exposure as 1 60th at f5.6. And that will also give you a better exposure. What will happen if you meter off of f8, 11, or 16, increasing with those stops, your meter reading will become less accurate and you will likely have an underexposed to significantly underexposed image. So next thing we're going to do is talk about how to shoot in manual mode with this camera. And basically what you want to do is similar to what you do for stop down metering, but you don't have to use the depth of field preview. We're going to switch this out of A, and if we want to shoot, let's say, F4, and what we'll do is we'll have to press the shutter button, and the meter needle will go to an aperture based on our shutter speed. If we have 1 60th and we have to press this and the meter needle goes to F4, we're good to go to take our photo. However, if we have to press this at 1 60th and the meter needle goes to F8, we have two choices. We can either go to F8 or we can go to 1 250th, or a third choice would be go to 1 1 25th and F5 6. Basically, what you're going to do to use manual mode on this camera is select the shutter speed, select an aperture, have to press, and then modify your settings until you have something that agrees with it. Your meter display will show you the aperture, so adjusting your shutter speed will allow you to uh, either pick the best shutter speed for the aperture you want to shoot with, or figure out what settings you're going to use based on what's available to you and the, the light that you have. The, the camera is, was not designed to be a primarily manual mode camera. So it's not perfect for that. It's a little bit frustrating and fidgety to use manual mode, but if you want to understand how exposure works, and in, or if you have an idea to intentionally under or overexpose to shoot low key or high key, you would have to do it through manual mode, and that's how you do it. So the next thing we're gonna do is take everything that we have learned, and we're going to put it all together and I'm going to show you how to take a photo with your Canon AE-1. Okay, so we just talked about manual mode, so we're not going to go over that again. We're going to just going to shoot it in shutter priority mode. Basically, what you want to do is look through your viewfinder, get your focus set, make sure that your shutter speed is what you want it to be, and then take your picture. Because this is a shutter priority camera, Whatever shutter speed you select, as long as there is an appropriate amount of light for it with the, with the lens's aperture range, you can take a picture and the camera will pick the best shutter speed for you. And that's that. It's really super simple. After you take your picture, then you just advance the film. All right, so that's super easy. We've taken an, ex an exposure. What about double exposures? Double exposures are a little bit fidgety with this camera because it's not designed to do it and it doesn't have the, uh, the buttons to do it automatically. You've got to trick the camera. A few different ways to do that. Okay, You can do it in manual mode. Let's, so first thing, let's talk a little bit about the science of the double exposure. If you have your film in your camera 
and you do a proper exposure with it, the film will receive the proper amount of light to take one image. Now, if you put twice the amount of light onto your film by doing an uncontrolled double exposure, what happens is that you will get a very thick or dense or dark negative. Those are interchangeable terms. That will give you reduced contrast when you print it or digitize it. It will give you increased noise when you digitize it, and it will kind of just make your images look a little bit muddy. Modern films are a little bit more forgiving in that regard, but it's good to have a good double exposure practice if you're going to do this. So, what you need to do is cut the amount of light reaching your film in half for a double exposure. So let's say that 1 125th and f5.6 is a proper exposure for your given lighting. There are a couple of different things you can do. Set it to 1 125th, and then we know it's f5.6 because the meter's telling us that. We need to cut the light in half. We can either go to 1 250th, because these are fractions, so the higher number is less time. 1 250th of a second is half as long as 1 1 25th. Or you can go to f8. Again, fractions. Higher number is smaller. The opening at f8 in the lens's aperture is smaller than f5.6. Relative, the amount of light, the number of photons passing through the lens at going from f5.6 to f8 is the same change in photons going from 1 1 25th to 1 2 50th. That's why that works. So in double exposures, you can manually adjust it, and then the camera will just do what you need it to do. And honestly, that's going to be the easiest way to do it. The way I'm going to show you next is, is harder. So the other way you can do it is leave this in automatic mode and come over here and adjust your ISO. If you're shooting a 400 ISO film and you want to cut the amount of light in half, you can do that by adjusting your ISO setting. So you lift the ring and then, if you guessed you go to 800, you would be correct. 800 film is one stop faster, one stop faster, so 120, 125 to 1 that's a faster shutter speed. So 1 800th, is well, 800 ISO rather is faster film than 400. In fact, it is one stop faster, one stop, one stop. So the amount of light needed to give you the exact same exposure on 800 ISO as 400 is half as much. So if you set this to 800, the meter will think that you have 800 ISO film and it will give you half as much light. Functionally the same thing as adjusting either of these settings. So what you can do at that point is either adjust your shutter speed to give you the aperture you want, or leave your shutter speed alone, and the camera will give you a smaller aperture. Take your first photo, and then you're going to take your second photo. For all of these, that's the, the science behind it. You're going to take two photos. That's, next I'm gonna show you the mechanical way of doing that. After you finish your double exposure, if you do it that way, you just need to make sure to set this back to 400, otherwise the entire rest of your roll will be underexposed to stop. Okay, so you have taken, you're gonna take your double exposure. You take your first frame, I'm assuming all of your settings are correct. Hold down the film rewind button over on this side. Pop the film rewind knob out and hold it in place so that the film doesn't advance. And then, use the film advance lever. What that's going to do is that's going to hold the film steady while the, fil while the camera rearms the shutter so that your film doesn't move and now you can take your second exposure. Okay, we're not done yet. After you take your second exposure, because you have done that process with your first one, the gearing is not properly aligned. So you can advance your film, but it's not going to advance your film the whole way. Instead of advancing at one frame, it's going to advance at a partial frame. So the next thing you need to do is set your shutter speed to 1 1,000th and manually set your aperture to the smallest setting, which is the highest number, and put your lens cap on. And now you're going to take a dead frame. 
And if the dead frame then will allow the partially advanced double exposure to advance the whole way. If you don't take that dead frame, then what's gonna happen is your next frame will partially overlap your double exposure and it will ruin both shots. So the dead frame is an important part of this process and uh, mandatory for having a successful double exposure. So let's talk about some basic flash technique with this camera. <clears throat> we talked about how the flash worked earlier. Let's talk about some techniques. Now hold your head to the side here, uh, only because I need this additional space. And let's pretend that this is a flash that's mounted onto your camera's hot shoe. This is the absolute worst possible place for a flash right here. What's gonna happen is when you take your picture, your, the light from your flash will exit the flash, reach your subject, bounce back to your lens, and it will make them look flat and waxy, and it's very unflattering. So, what you want to try to do is get a flash that articulates. If you're gonna mount it on top of your camera, you want to try to bounce your flash up to the ceiling, and then back down to your subject, and then back to your lens. The reason for that is, everywhere we go, all the time, we are seeing our subjects, whether they're people or buildings or trees, lit from above. The sun is above us. Lights in the ceilings of our buildings are above us. That's why in old film noir movies, when things are lit from below, it indicates a sinister person, right? Because lighting from below is unnatural to the way that we see the world. So the best thing to do if you're gonna use the hot shoe is to articulate the lens upward so that you can use your bounce flash. Okay, you're outside. Hmm, well, that's a problem. If you're outside, see if you can find a wall, bounce your flash off the side like that. That's a, that's a better idea. Another option is to invest in like a $3 flash bar, which looks like this. Screws into the underside of your camera, screws into the bottom of your flash, or if your flash doesn't have a tripod socket, just get a hot shoe adapter with one, screw your flash into it, and then you have your flash off to the side here, connect it to the PC socket, and now you have a side flash. It's not perfect, but it's a whole lot better than having the flash here on top of your camera. And that's and basically, if you're gonna be doing flash use, you can use any flash on this camera that has an X strobe, going back to 1980s Vivitars. A, a brand new generic flash will work as well today. <clears throat> you don't have to buy a fancy flash for this camera because it can't make the most of them. But uh, a used older flash or a brand new, very, very basic flash will work perfectly, especially one with manual settings. And that's just the basic technique is you want to Think about how you're going to control your light to flatter your subject. People especially are flattered when the light comes down from above them or the side, if possible, or up and diagonal down this way. They are never flattered when the light comes forward, bounces off of them, and back at the lens. Also, if you're in a dusty environment, um, using a bounce flash like this off to the side or up above will cut most of the dust out of the image. If you have your flash here and it bounces and at your subject and comes back, all of the dust between your lens and your subject that's in the air will also show up. If that's what you want, if you're say shooting, um, like if you're doing a shot where somebody has got a bag of flour exploding on their, their face and you really wanna emphasize that, then you can use a flash up here to catch some of that dust. Anyway, lots and lots of different techniques for flash. Uh, learning how to use a flash or multiple flashes perfectly is something that many people spend their entire lives doing. And it's a rabbit hole that can be really rewarding if you go down it and do it well. Uh, so at any rate, basic flash technique, try to get an articulating flash if you're gonna use it up here so that you can bounce it off the ceiling or if you only have a flash that's fixed forward, invest in a flash bar and a PC cable so you can put your camera flash off to the side and angle it this way when you use it. And that is our second video on this, the Canon AE-1. We have covered everything that really there is to know about how to use it. So at this point, you can take it, go forward, 
and successfully capture images with your Canon AE-1. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.